sheep live their whole lives in fear of wolves. In the end, though, they are eaten by the shepherd. My name is Theta, and this is the Not Quite Daily Show. This is the first episode of the winter 2019 season, and today announces the choice of series for a return to the long format analysis. We will also set up the videos which will follow by populating our initial list of goals and conflicts and themes, and we'll look at some initial world building and characterization as well. We did something a little differently this season, um, as I explained back in the State of Show video, waiting until at least three episodes in before making a choice. In all previous seasons, I have chosen off of the premiere only. I was happy with my choices in the past, and by pure chance, this season ended up being one where I would have struggled to make a decision from the first episodes only. The show I have chosen is The Promised Netherland, and it's really the third episode that pushed me over the edge. I was also strongly considering Dororo and Boogie Pop, and they have a lot of their own merits. All of these shows have a bit of a horror thing going on as well. Uh, we haven't done anything like that yet, so this was going to be a nice change-up no matter what I decided. I ultimately chose Promise Neverland from these three because of the stronger initial characterizations. I am very character and theme-centric in my analysis, and while I do expect Dororo especially to eventually have robust characterization, it is too much of an unknown right now by comparison. It is definitely killing it on theme though, and MAPPA once again proves that their content is always worth investigating. Uh, the Promised Neverland is not going to be a complete story, um, and it's also only one core, uh, but the direction especially has been very impressive, and I know the source material is well received. I've spoken before about how my analysis style relies on giving the creators the benefit of the doubt, which means I am looking for a reason to trust that they know what they're doing. So far, I've been given a lot of reasons to believe. The videos in this series after today's will be the Darling style long look, with a scene by scene walkthrough, followed by the analysis categories, uh, with world building and characterization covered inside that walkthrough. There are going to be slight changes to goals and speculation for this season, um, which I will go over when we get there. Let's get started. We'll start with our goals category. Um, for first episodes, I try to explain what goes into each of these category sections for anyone who has not seen my past work, so I apologize to those already familiar with my analytical framework. One day, I guess I will just make a standalone video for that purpose and can point people at it, but... Um, goals are basically the motivations that drive characters. They are the things that characters want badly enough that it influences their actions. For this reason, goals always belong to one or more characters. Though, it's entirely possible that we may recognize a goal without knowing who it belongs to, or know that a character has a goal that drives them um, without us yet knowing what it is. The reason I track goals is that they can help us understand both the narrative and the characters. Goals and conflicts together are the engines that drive a plot, and goals can often give us a more tangible sense of progress as they are pursued, met, or abandoned. What goals a character has will also tell you a lot about them. This is especially true when you see how goals may be added, dropped, or altered over the course of a story, or how they may choose one desire over another at a key moment. We're going to try something slightly different this time around. Whenever a character has multiple goals, we are going to try to guess which ones take priority over the others, a kind of goal ranking, if you will. Uh, sometimes a key part of a story or character journey isn't someone meeting or dropping a goal, but choosing one goal to be more important than another, especially if it's a reversal of what came before. Let us start with Emma, as she has the best case for the central character right now. Um, as I see it, she has three main goals, and they currently rank in this order. Protect her family, escape from the farm, and keep secrets. Escape the farm and keep secrets are also shared with Norman and Ray, and we'll get to them in a moment. 
for Emma right now, keeping what she knows and what they're doing secret is important, but it is in service to the other two goals. She and the other two are not hiding the things they've learned just to cut the other children out, but because sharing that information recklessly endangers the other goals. If a time comes when spilling what she has seen or knows helps advance the escaping or protecting goals, then she will do so. This probably also means that she will be more reckless with their secrets than she will be when it comes to planning for escape or trying to protect the others. Her absent-minded search of Carol in front of Gilda when she thinks out loud about protecting everyone is a good example of this. I fully expect that just as she and Norman decided to share their secret with Ray to advance the escape goal, they will relent over time and share with those who can advance their other goals. Second in importance for Emma, then, is to escape the farm. In her case, it means escaping with everyone. As she says, she wants Connie to be the last. From what she understands about the world right now, escaping the farm with everyone is the only solution to achieve her primary goal, protect her family. If it turns out there is a way to protect them without escaping the farm, or even without everyone escaping the farm, then I expect that to be the path she takes because protecting her family is the dominant goal. She won't escape herself if it means she can't protect them, at least the way her goals are arranged right now. Um, if more is required beyond escaping the farm, such as creating a new place for humans in demon society, then she will pursue that as well. Norman has a similar set of goals, though his primary goal I am calling Keep Emma Smiling. He tells Ray that he likes her, though it might be a bit early to assume this is the romantic kind of liking someone. Um, he was amazed that Emma was more upset about her family dying than she was about the threat to herself. He knows logically that trying to save everyone inhibits the goal of escaping the farm, but because keeping Emma smiling is a more important goal for him right now, he is going to help her achieve her own primary goal. He also shares the escape and secrets goals with her, with a similar ordering for a similar reason. Ray's primary goal is the escape goal. Involving Emma and Norman helps this goal, but I don't think saving them alone trumps his own desire to be spared. Thus, their primary goals potentially work against his own, even though they all share that desire to escape. This seems like the kind of thing that could turn the narrative at some future point. It may actually be that Ray's primary goal is to save himself, and if an opportunity presents itself to do that without escaping, that he might take that option. Um, but that is more speculative and so doesn't really belong in this section. He also has the secrets goal, and has already demonstrated that he would be willing to use violence to keep their flight secret. Because he has taken on dealing with the tracking devices himself, I'm going to give him a tertiary goal of deal with tracking. Um, I'll have more to say about Ray later on. We also have some discernible goals among our adults. Isabella has two goals that seem to drive her right now. Deliver the goods and keep the breach secret. Of these two, I think keeping the secret is her primary goal. She knows some of her charges must have learned the truth about the demons, about Connie, about what it really means to leave Gracefield House. Crone's reaction to this news suggests that there is protocol for this, that they are supposed to ship them out immediately. Isabella knows this, of course, but has chosen not to do so. She is keeping the secret of this breach, well, secret. The reason she is doing so is because of the other goal, deliver the goods. In her interaction with Grandma and the peaks we've gotten into the demon world, we've picked up that there is some importance to the timing of when the children are harvested, especially the highest quality goods. Her farm is apparently the only one positioned to deliver these high quality goods at the next appropriate time. If she lets them know that the secret is out, then it will ship these children prematurely and she will be unable to deliver them when it is most beneficial. Crone's praise of Isabella when they are first alone indicates that she already has a reputation for delivering a lot of high quality goods, so the accompanying prestige is likely important to her. Now the reason I am putting keeping the secret above deliver the goods is because of how I think she would act if she had to choose between them. The secret goal only exists because of delivering the goods, 
And it may be that in a different situation, she would have already fessed up to the breach. However, Crone's monologue tells us that Isabella would be in trouble if this got out. The punishment for what she is doing by hiding the breach is likely greater than the reward for being the one to deliver. Thus, I think if she had to choose, if it was a choice between being discovered and failing to deliver, she would simply fail to deliver. For example, if, say, Norman was about to be in a position to rat her out, I think she would silence him and lose him as offering rather than allow herself to be outed. When the goals clash, the secret keeping will win out. In fact, that tension between these goals within her is the whole reason we have a story at all right now. Her desire to deliver the goods when it matters most is what has kept her from following protocol. That hesitation is why our trio is having the opportunity to scheme and discover and plan. Thus, what Isabella has to do is not force the moment to its crisis while also keeping them from escaping before the demons can take delivery. If she pushes too hard and they try to run away, then she may be unable to contain the secret. This is likely why she made it plain that she can track them, to discourage them from trying to escape, but without acting directly. To further preserve the stalemate, she has asked for assistance and received Crone. Now, Crone may be a bit crazy, but she's not stupid. Isabella is a superlative house mom, and so there must be some reason she is asking for assistance. Crone wastes no time in asking why she was called in. And Isabella, also knowing that Crone is no fool, tells her directly. The revelation of the cover-up presents Crone with a dilemma and perhaps an opportunity. Thus, her goals for the story are become a house mom and to find the targets. Becoming a house mom is the primary goal, and she has two ways to pursue it that have come up. She can help Isabella with her goals, which puts Isabella in her debt. Down the line, she can perhaps call in a favor from the well-regarded house mom to achieve this goal. Or she believes that if she can find the children that have learned the secret and report Isabella's violation, it will remove Isabella from her position. Since she would be the one obeying the rules in this scenario, she reasons that this will get her to house mom even more quickly, perhaps even right here in Gracefield House. Thus, her secondary goal is to figure out which of the children are the culprits. Once she has this information, she actually has a choice about how she goes about pursuing her primary goal. If she fails to find them, or it doesn't look like it will pan out, then she can still pretend to be on Isabella's side and incur a debt with her cooperation. Therefore, Crone must maintain the front that she is on Isabella's side, as it keeps both of her paths to house mom open. Just as Isabella's desire to deliver the goods at the right time is creating opportunity for our children, Crone's plan to betray Isabella for her own promotion may open up a window for our trio to advance one of their own goals. Looking at these five characters' goals um, and the way they are prioritized pretty well encapsulates the entire narrative tension right now. Lastly, and it's hard to define this exactly, but we are going to give a kind of generic goal to our demons. Um, that's how they are referred to in our translated subtitles, so that's what we're going to go with. Um, there isn't much sense of individuals yet, but we can understand enough to know that the high-scoring older children are meant as a special meal for someone referred to as him. Thus, I am at least going to put up a goal here for demons, present meal to him. No concept of what they can or will do if things don't go as expected, but we can assume this is a goal they would pursue if Isabella can't deliver, and it can thus influence our story. More details on this and any further nuance as the story progresses. The other half of what drives story is conflict. I do not ascribe to the idea of a central conflict, something like man versus man or man versus nature and all that. Um, instead, conflicts in my framework are smaller and numerous and often are in direct competition with someone's goals. They too can help us measure narrative progress as each conflict is resolved or altered along the way. Now, for something to go on this list, it must appear to be a solvable conflict within the scope of the story. The example I like to give is for you to imagine a story about the D-Day landings at Normandy. 
In that story, there might be the large conflict of wresting control of the beach, with lots of smaller conflicts involved in landing the boats or taking out specific tactical targets. However, World War II itself would not be a conflict in the scope of that story. It is setting, the background against which the narrative is told. It is not solvable within the story, and thus it is pointless to track it. It doesn't go on the list. Only things we believe can be solved will populate this category. This includes unknown elements whose reveal can potentially derail the narrative or characters as they normally would have proceeded. So starting off, what seems like the farthest reaching conflict is the children's fate as food. Everything else basically flows from the situation. We don't have enough information about the wider world right now, and the fact that there is a demon society in charge of at least some of humanity might be a conflict. I don't have any sense that such a situation is solvable inside our story though, so we are not going to make it a conflict. We'll revisit if necessary. At the very least, the children's fate as food seems to be something they might can overcome. Whether that means putting themselves beyond the reach of the demon society, or finding some other fate, we'll just have to wait and see. But this is the primary threat to our protagonists, and all other conflicts right now are related to it. Next then is Gracefield House Prison. This also has what are basically sub-conflicts, but the main reason they are at risk of being converted into food is that this orphanage is really a farm and a prison. The walls and the gate physically contain them, and the scrutiny from their overseers prevent them from easily escaping beyond. As Ray explains to Emma, this is not the last conflict, that even if they escape from this place, it is still likely a demon's world on the outside. They will continue to be meant as food even if they are not physically trapped here. But for now, this is the tangible conflict that seems resolvable, and overcoming it is therefore their shared goal. Now, three extra conflicts make this prison conflict much harder to defeat. The first is that the overseers, who are already an impediment, actively suspect that at least two of them know the truth of the situation, making it harder to work against the other conflicts. Thus, caretakers suspect them is a conflict in its own right. It may be solvable before the other conflicts, if they can keep their act up enough to persuade Isabella and Crone that they were mistaken. Alternatively, they can spread the information to other children that the caretakers do not suspect, which may allow them to work on the other impediments despite being suspected themselves. This is a conflict that can be solved separately from any of the others, but it also is one they can ignore if they succeed at all the others. Um, it would just make them easier. One of these is the tracking devices. Isabella clued them into their existence as a means to discourage their escape, um, as I mentioned before. But having done so, she now needs to ensure they stay trackable. When Isabella corners Emma for a moment next to the board of the kids' drawings, she remarks that Emma wasn't so cheerful that morning. And then, as though she is checking to see if Emma feels feverish, she runs her hand behind her left ear. It seems innocuous at the time, but the next episode it will be suggested that this is just where the tracking devices are implanted when Emma finds a mark on baby Carol. So, quite apart from the threat of the tracking devices and how they may defeat any escape, Isabella at least is going to be watching to see if they find them or try to remove them. If they do not defeat the tracking before they escape the orphanage, then they are not much better off than if they stayed put. They have to defeat both of these conflicts to have a chance to escape their fate. Lastly, they believe they have a traitor in their midst. This is a pretty similar conflict to caretakers suspect them, with the added complication that they don't know who is monitoring them and even what that person may know. I feel like probably Isabella didn't sit one kid down and say, hey, we plan to one day ship all of you out as demon food, but these older kids are getting in the way. Do you mind helping me out? Right? Um, so it may be that traitor is too harsh of a term here, and one of the kids has simply been recruited to report anything suspicious to Isabella without knowing the real reason why. If it is something like this, then finding the traitor and converting them to something of a double agent 
might end up being an unexpected boon. However, if it's someone who grasped the situation and is saving their own skin, then this conflict may be dire indeed. Certainly, a completely complicit traitor will make absconding with every single kid nigh impossible. Now, characterizations next, it will be contained within the walkthrough sections in following videos, but for this one will be divided out separately. Well, we will do the same for world building in the next bit. Um, characterization is basically what we understand about characters based on what the story has revealed to this point. While our goals section keeps track of the primary movers for our cast, characterization is more of a look at their tendencies and temperaments. Usually there is an initial characterization presented to the audience, and then the plot will begin to shape and be shaped by these starting positions. Over time, this may change the characters themselves, and noticing the ways the story communicates to this to us helps us understand both the characters and the thrust of the work. Um, a lot of my effort and analysis goes into trying to get into the heads of our characters and understand their actions. For now, we'll just visit the five characters who have had the most screen time. We'll start again with Emma. She is characterized early on as caring a lot about her family, all the other kids who she thinks of as siblings. This is outright stated by Isabella, and is obvious even beyond that in the way she plays a doting older sister to practically everyone younger. We even see them coming to her for help getting ready as though out of long habit. She fits the trope of the older girl who takes on surrogate mother duties when the need arises. However, this is not a burden to her, but rather her joy. In fact, Emma is frequently smiling and taking delight in the moment. She wears her emotions openly, and up until the end of the premiere, that dominant emotion seems to have been happiness. Though she is able to score perfectly on their morning tests, she isn't characterized by the other children as being particularly brilliant in the way they think of Norman and Ray, but rather as someone who is so good at learning that she can keep up with them. That same little discussion paints her as being very athletic, which reflects the energy she puts into expressing herself and what she feels. The impression I get of Emma's capabilities is that her best quality is being adaptable. However, this is weighted against a certain naivete. She feels things very strongly. She has very high highs and probably equally low lows. Perhaps because of this, she prioritizes how she feels as the standard to guide her behavior. It's just asking for failure to try to save all of them, even the infants, but because she wants to and feels strongly about it, logic isn't going to gain any purchase. She can be downright obstinate over whatever position she chooses, as she demonstrates when Ray tries to talk some sense into her about their impossible situation. She resists any reality that stirs up that feeling of losing something. Even after witnessing Connie's body and the demons, she is still in shock and denial moments later when she and Norman get away. She has little experience with negative emotions, and is the most likely of our trio to lose her head when under the gun. Her compassion is thus a potential weakness. Norman exploits it in the first game of Tag, pretending to hurt himself because he knows she'll emerge to check on him. It's obvious enough to be in her file, too, as Crone knew this about her just from reading her data. Crone even announces that Emma's weakness is her naivete, the belief that she can indulge her compassionate side without consequence. Emma put herself in a position to be caught in the game of tag with Crone just because she didn't want the two kids in front of her to be tagged. That said, Emma's compassion has the potential to also be a source of strength. Certainly, she is unmoved when Ray attempts to dissuade her from the madness of hoping to save everyone. Norman didn't even bother, despite understanding the situation just as well as Ray. Emma may be stubborn and intractable over naive positions, but she is likely to display the same intractability when things get hard down the line. Isabella is trying to discourage them from trying anything, both with the compass reveal and bringing in Crone, but Emma is not going to be derailed that easily. When presented with the fact that the outside world is probably a demon society, she doesn't abandon the idea of leaving. She simply widens her horizons to include making a space for them in the outside world. She will potentially be a source of encouragement and hope, even when the others give up. 
Norman is primarily characterized by his intelligence. Even among the trio, he is held up as a mind with no equal. This is counterbalanced by his physical weakness, which is also something Crone knew from his file. He and Ray both are far more even keeled in their emotions compared to Emma, with Norman defaulting to contented smiles or neutral expressions most of the time. He is not emotionless though, being highly disturbed over the episode with Connie and able to laugh at Ray's inability to overcome Emma's stubbornness. As we discussed in Goals, he is also quite attached to Emma, and so while he is not as overtly emotional as she is, he is not some coldly calculating logician. He even tried to put on a brave face after Isabella corners Emma near the drawings, offering Emma a hand to stand back up. But they both notice that his hand is shaking. It actually seems to bond them in purpose. Norman is also very confident without it reaching the level of arrogance. When Ray raises the possibility of Emma dying because of insisting on trying to save everyone, Norma confidently asserts that he won't let her die, that he is going to utilize himself. And then, almost casually, he points out that he's always accomplished what he set out to do. The sense I get from Norman is one of determination. While Emma might choose a decision based on how she feels and stubbornly refuse to budge, Norman is like to carefully choose his best option and then pursue it to its conclusion. In this way, they both contrast with Ray. Ray is also cool-headed compared to Emma, but where Norman defaults to a kind of contentment, Ray appears to more easily be moved to aggression or annoyance. Crone's assessment of his weakness is that he makes decisions quickly, but abandons them with similar haste. He does not have Emma's stubbornness or Norman's determination. He also differs from them by adopting a bit of an outsider role in their little mini-society. He's frequently reading under the tree rather than participating in the games of others, and at times comes off as a third wheel to the more obvious partnership between Emma and Norman. He watches them run to try to return Little Bunny to Connie rather than join them, and lingers outside their bedroom later rather than confront them, despite how obviously out of sorts they were. I don't think we see him interact with anyone aside from Emma or Norman until they begin the training sequences at the end of the third episode. Ray also seems less easily surprised than Emma or Norman. That may suggest something aside from his temperament, but we see that he does not look panicked when Crone shows up at the end of episode two, nor when she confronts him and Norman while they do dishes. He is able to accept the entire demon's farm livestock thing with only a hint of being disoriented. While Emma and Norman are at first out of sorts about Crone showing up, it's Ray who immediately moves on to examining how she and Carol actually represent two potential sources of new information. In fact, the only time we see Ray really get out of sorts is when Emma is completely defying his risk analysis about their chances of getting everyone out. Having his logic ignored or countered is more upsetting to him than the idea that he is destined for some demon's dinner plate. Now, he is also characterized as intelligent. However, his intelligence perhaps favors certain subjects or applications compared to Norman's more general genius. He is apparently into machines and engineering, and Norman believes he is the better tactician between them. He perhaps is more of the coldly calculating type, with his mind turning as surely and precisely as the gears of machinery. Things like game theory and risk analysis might come naturally to him, providing a tactical advantage, but making it difficult for him to understand irrational actors. This probably extends to him calculating and recalculating the best course of action moment to moment dispassionately, rather than picking a path and sticking to it like the other two. Isabella turns out to be a master tactician in her own right. Norman states that they have never beaten her at chess, and the moves and counter moves she has made in the series thus far suggest someone planning a few steps ahead. Up until now, they had no reason to suspect that she was anything but the warm, surrogate mother that she projected. Her behavior when alone with Crone and on the radio speaking to Grandma reveals someone who is no-nonsense in temperament, but will seek to manipulate others as though it is second nature. Her personality is a chameleon's act, 
and she must be a masterful actor indeed to have hidden her impersonal side from the children for years on end. She's very calculating, and yet that raises a question about her behavior in hiding the breach. Now, without a better sense of the world outside, it's hard to guess why she would risk her position by hiding things, especially sharing her disobedience with Crone, but it at least suggests that there is something beyond being the mom of this house that she has her sights set on. Providing the supreme goods at the right moment, when no one else can, must be a critical part of this for her to have decided that the risk-reward ratio was in her favor. Crone is calculating in her own way, and sees the cover-up as her opportunity to advance. She is much more expressive and emotional than Isabella. The two of them contrast in a similar way as Norman and Emma. While Isabella is a bit of a Stepford smiler, Crone is portrayed as someone on the verge of becoming unglued. Once alone, she has a very animated conversation with a beat-up baby doll, as though Crone herself was one of the children in this orphanage, playing out an imaginary scenario. The doll is a confidant, but she's also destructive and abusive toward it. This makes me wonder if it's an externalization of part of her own ego. At the least, we are meant to regard her as crazy and potentially unpredictable. I suspect any human who lives with the knowledge of what is going on in these farms must be a little disturbed. Um, to also assist the process gleefully suggests they may be unhinged. Something is probably mentally unhealthy about Crone and Isabella both, and probably any other complicit human in the outside world. Sanity might be a hard thing to hold on to if the world outside is ruled by monsters who think of you as livestock. Speaking of that outside world, let's discuss world building. World building is basically setting, but is especially concerned with the rule set of the scenario in which the story is set. In general, we accept that a story world is like our own reality until it is specified as otherwise. We will assume, for example, that people walking around on something that looks Earth-like will be on Earth, and that the composition of the air is the same, the pull of gravity is the same, that normal biological processes are the same, and so on. We only need to be told the things that are different, and then only if these differences are important to understanding. Usually, the bigger the difference, the sooner it needs to be communicated. Big reveals about fundamental aspects of a setting late in a story are a good way to lose an audience. Small things can be filled in over time, or reserved for key reveals, so long as we have enough to understand in the meantime. Speculative fiction stories all face the problem of trying to communicate the way they differ to an audience, at the same time they are trying to move narrative and characterization along. A key part of this is pacing the revelation of details, um, instead of trying to do it all in one go and ensuring that things an audience needs to know are introduced before they become relevant to a plot point or character moment. Now, in the specific example of the promised Neverland, we have the biggest reveal positioned at the end of the premiere. It is appropriately foreshadowed that this idyllic orphan existence may not be quite what it seems by the very first scene, in which a younger version of our trio are looking through the gate and wondering what its existence signifies. Outside of that, though, the rest of the episode suggests a world very much like our own. Only the date on the calendar indicates that this is not set on present-day Earth. We are in the year 2045, or at least that is what the children are told. All of this sets up the reveal with Connie's death, the strange flower, the otherworldly demons, and the revelation that this is not so much an orphanage as a farm. It's a shock by its contrast to the rest of the episode, but it also gets the biggest departure from our reality in front of the audience while still in the initial setup of the story. So then, what are all the ways we know that this is different from our reality? Um, it is 2045, at least as far as we know. In spite of this, Gracefield House seems very not futuristic. They use lanterns, uh, analog clocks and calendars, and the architecture and furnishings that could easily be 100 years old. Even the truck that the demons presumably used would seem old to us in the present. 
The only thing which seems unusual to the rest of the setting is the testing apparatus. The tank they put Connie in later is the only other thing future-seeming. And so even without their deductions about their brains, we should guess that the testing and preservation parts of all this were particularly important to whoever was in charge. We know that Isabella and Crone answer to demons, and so presumably all of Earth, or this region at least, are under their control. They have not seen fit to alter the surface in significant ways, and have the children raised in an environment that mimics a world without demon control. Except for the testing, this could have been practically anywhere, at practically any point in the last century. Thus, something about this farming process favors that approach. We know that the children are born somewhere else before coming here, and they are fitted with tracking beacons before they arrive, and that there are several other farms, or plants as they seem to be called. Um, Isabella gives not her name, but a five-digit number when she checks in via radio. And so the numbering and commodifying of humans extends beyond those slated for food. This is definitely more of a master race, slave race situation rather than some distorted business arrangement. There is some kind of hierarchy in the demons as well, though we have very little information right now. They are not monolithic and may even be more than one species in some kind of confederation. Certainly, their body types range through several types that we have seen. They do all seem to have these bone-like faces or masks, despite varying bodies. Our very first demons refer to Connie as something for the rich, not something the likes of us can have. The children are special fare for privileged classes in the society. This subdivides further with allusions to a him character, and all of the fuss and worrying about adequately preparing his meal at something called the Tifari. As the demon who I am assuming is the boss says, his meal is special and nothing like ours. Considering the importance of the timing and his further statements about offering their prayers to him, this Tifari thing has the air of ritual or tribute or worship. Not enough to go on yet, but demon society has some clear stratification. Now, as to those meals. Uh, Norman and Emma deduce that the brains must be the main draw, for why else care so much about the age or the scores? However, the demons that collected Connie talked about the deliciousness of human flesh, and one even wished he could eat just one little fingertip. Obviously then, the meat is also eaten. Like cattle, there must be more desirable cuts which are priced respectively, with the brain the most lucrative. In this admittedly awful analogy, the brains of high-scoring children are prized further still, like a fillet of Kobe beef. The unexplained part of the process so far is what the red flowers have to do with anything. Connie's body was soaking wet with this little red bouquet sprouting from her chest. Are these flowers themselves a type of food, or do they have some other significance? Or are they simply a way of preserving the bodies, or changing something about their end taste? There has been a lot of imagery around the flowers so far, so whatever it is will probably be important. A um, couple miscellaneous things then. Uh, Isabella makes a reference to getting perfect scores every morning when talking to Crone, which suggests that adults like them may have originated from a system similar to the one they are administering. Certainly, the five-digit code part is the same. If these two were also once kids who got perfect scores each day, then we can assume they should be more than a match for our trio. We also have the tracking devices, which as Ray says, would need to have a battery which lasts more than 10 years, and we know they must be incredibly small. He guesses they are using radio waves, and that the individual can't be specified. This is still a bit of a mystery, but it definitely raises the specter of some technology they don't understand. It's odd to have this and the testing desks contrasted against things like Isabella's radio station, which we can see is old enough tech to still use reel-to-reel -reel recording. So, theme. Theme is often the centerpiece of what I do here, and it pulls from all of the other categories and can help inform them as well. I want to point out that when I say theme, I'm using it as a catch-all for thematic elements. 
That means that actual themes go here, but so will symbols and metaphors, so will motifs, so will observations about structure patterns. Um, what I do here is not academic analysis, but pop analysis. And so I use terminology in ways that help simplify the presentation. Clarity over accuracy. At a very basic level, storytelling is about patterns. This section is the primary place where we examine these patterns and what they suggest about the work itself and the ideas it is trying to explore. Much like with conflict, I reject the idea of a central theme for a story of any length, so there will be no attempt to endorse one theme as what the story is about. Um, as we are still early in our series, I'm going to try to keep the count of things uh, pretty low. First of all, there is a persistent set of symbols and techniques to reinforce the narrative clock. Basically, one of the ways to build tension in a story is to have a deadline that characters are racing against. Our show established such a deadline when Norman figures out that the past patterns of kids leaving should give them two months before it will be their time to be shipped out. They do not have as much time as they want to find a solution, which puts a sense of urgency and even desperation on every day and every move. The show has been relentless in keeping this clock in our minds. The episode titles are the dates, written day, month, year, October 12th, 13th, and 18th of 2045. The stopwatch is superimposed over the games of tag, and we frequently have shots of the clock or the calendar. The camera mimics the sway of the pendulum at one point. Even the promotional art poster gets in on the game, mixing a clock on its hands with a dinner plate and utensils, as well as placing the back of a stopwatch in such a way that it looks like a serving cover. All of these techniques together communicate that idea that the day you are going to be food draws closer with relentless regularity. Next, we have a grand metaphor of playing tag, or perhaps playing chess. Um, there is some crossover here, as Ray outright states that tag is like chess, but using your entire body. Then we have a reference to them playing chess against Isabella, and never winning, and then the later example of them playing tag against Crone, which two of them do win. I feel like both of these instances of playing games against the caretakers are probably symbolically the same thing, but it may be that there is enough nuance down the stretch to separate them. For now, I'll put them together. Uh, Tag ends up doing more than one thing in the story. It's something the kids do a lot, and thus is emblematic of their innocence, a game with no stakes which reflects their carefree lives. But Ray's explanation to Emma about why Norman is able to beat her basically tells her that she can't treat it like a simple game of tag if she wants to win. This foreshadows that their simple, carefree lives will soon change into something they must take seriously if they want to win. Tag then becomes a cover for their training. Teaching the kids how to avoid the person who is it is training them to avoid anyone who might hunt them. It, too, is a simple game now that will have more serious implications later. And then, of course, Tag is a mirror to their overall conflict and it comes complete with the time limit that we've said is reinforced repeatedly in the work. It actually works on two levels here. One is that they are trying to escape being discovered by Crone before they can execute their escape. That is the stopwatch that she is working against. The fact that a couple of them got away, but not all of them, especially that Emma got caught because of trying to carry others with her, may be quite the bit of foreshadowing. The other way the game of tag works is that the kids themselves are on a time limit, needing to get away from their pursuers before the day comes to ship them out. Once outside the walls, the game continues in a different way, but they must get to that stage before time runs out. That said, chess can also stand in for some of the actions thus far. The game they are playing against Isabella is definitely a series of moves and counter moves. After discovering the secret, Emma and Norman start planning their escape, even investigating the wall beyond the forest. Isabella responds by revealing the compass and tracking devices. She then corners Emma to see if she can surprise a guilty reaction out of her. Emma moves back, laying it on thick about what Connie might be doing and what she wished for, seeing if she can get her own reaction out of Isabella. 
Then Isabella asks the two of them directly if they went to the gate, again wanting them to know she is watching them and suspecting them. They then steal the linens to use as rope and decide to bring Ray into the plan, though he invites himself anyway. Isabella is shown noticing that Ray is not in his usual spot under the tree during this meeting. She interrupts their normal playtime, cutting this meeting short, to introduce Crone, which is her next move. Then they begin the training disguised as Tag, which Crone apparently only interrupts once. But Isabella recruits a traitor somewhere in this time period. All of that is very reminiscent of a game of chess, of trying to guess your opponent's move and think several steps ahead. And as they say, they've never beaten her at chess. Even in the final image of the end credits, we can see the stems of the red flowers growing down and penetrating three objects. A boot, which I think may symbolize Emma, since her boots are more visible and it would recall her athleticness. A book, which is almost certainly Ray. And lastly, a chess piece, which by elimination must mean Norman. This might represent the three strengths they each bring to the table. Emma's physicality, Ray's knowledge, and Norman's strategic planning. Or not. Uh, the point is that chess is being invoked more than once and should therefore be considered a potential thematic element, even if it's not as obvious as tag right now. Relatedly, and I'll just mention it alongside these two others, there is imagery of puzzle solving in the opening credits. The background behind each of our main trio are overlaid with outlines to make them recall jigsaw puzzles, and there is a later image of them breaking through a wall made of puzzle pieces. The little bit of testing that we saw looked a lot like puzzle solving, of matching and predicting patterns, something that recalls an IQ test, or the analytical reasoning part of the LSAT. Since we know they are scoring perfectly on this test, the implication is that they are very good at solving puzzles, and that opening further suggests that they can break free if they can solve the puzzle of their current predicament. Lastly, just since I'm talking about the credit sequences, do you think this little girl in the end credits is Isabella by chance? That's the same getup that Connie was wearing when she was led away. Um, next up is a way of framing a story that has come up surprisingly often in the shows I've chosen thus far. This is something I call World of Children, which is basically a storytelling technique where the story only works the way it does because the main characters are children and do not act the way adults would if they were in the same situation. It is often characterized by a distrust of authority or adults, as well as a naivete about the way of the world. A naivete that usually has a terrible collision with reality. I'm sure you can see how this describes the story to this point. That said, this is a little bit of an unusual situation because their distrust of authority is completely justified and they do not have any alternative adult figures they could choose to trust or reject. At least, not yet. Additionally, our trio seems like they may rapidly become very adult-like in their decision-making and it may not look like a normal World of Children story down the stretch, so I'll keep an eye on it. One theme that has come up a couple times already, and seems like it could be a strong, ongoing pattern, is trust and betrayal. The children all trusted Isabella completely as their mom, and their trust turns out to be horribly misplaced. When Emma and Norman realize this betrayal, they retract inward, at first not trusting to speak of the matter with anyone else. However, overcoming their situation is going to require them to trust each other and begin to trust others as well. To this end, they decide to bring Ray into their confidence. I'm sure they will expand the number of people they trust as it goes along. The ability to trust others is going to be a key part of their strength. However, the last episode raises the possibility of a traitor in their midst. They are set up for a second betrayal, and this will not only make them paranoid about their movements, it will make them reluctant to extend their trust any further. Thus, we have this tension set up, where they must weigh their desire to trust more people against their fear of a further betrayal. Even without an actual betrayal, the possibility of it may alter their decision and influence their characterization. Now, we may eventually have a theme of paranoia, and it may need to simply be a part of the trust and betrayal theme, 
Um, but for now, I just want to point out some of the camera techniques that heighten this paranoid and horror-like feeling that dogs are characters. There are frequently scenes where the camera behaves as though it is eavesdropping on their conversations, like a spy trying to remain hidden. It gives the impression that they are being watched. There is also a lot of putting bars of some kind between the camera and the kids, giving the impression of being imprisoned or trapped. Beyond the actual bars of the gates or the windows, we get this with the ladders and the library, or the bars of the crib when Carol grabs Emma's finger. This isn't limited to the kids, as Isabella will also appear behind bars created by a ladder. In a way, I suppose she too is trapped, and she too needs to worry about someone watching what she's doing. Lastly, there are a lot of dolly zooms, which is a technique strongly associated with horror movies or scenes involving a lot of dread. There is a lot of care to the way shots have been composed to instill a feeling of anxiety in the audience, to make us worry alongside the characters. Lastly, I have a collection of thoughts that I don't quite know how to categorize, so I'll just give you my unformed notes. Um, basically, I have noticed that the system is carrying the seeds of its own undoing within it. The way they select children for shipping is meant to concentrate the highest scorers into the oldest ages and take the lowest scorers away from the younger ages. In other words, their selection process over time should result in a greater concentration of older, smarter kids, at least until they turn 12 and are shipped out. This means that they inadvertently create a situation where those most capable of thwarting them are likely to be brought together. Their ambition contains within it the seeds for its downfall. This pattern is repeated in Isabella, who wants whatever it is she gains by delivering the supreme goods at the appointed time. Risking punishment for her lies or for allowing their escape could be her downfall, but it's her own actions that are giving such a turn a chance to come to fruition. This might also extend to Crone, whose desire to rat Isabella out and take the mom post for herself may also allow for some disruption of the normal order. I'm not sure what to call this yet, um, but if it continues to be a thing, I'll try to articulate it a little more clearly. So the biggest change to format is the combination of our two forward-looking sections from past shows. These were What to Watch For, which was about unknown things that we reasonably expected to be answered inside the story, and Speculation, which was my own guesses about the direction of the story and why I was guessing as much. Um, I had started to refer to What to Watch For as Remaining Mysteries instead um, in recent shows, and I'm going to take this one step further. Basically, we will still look at the mysteries the show has introduced, the known unknowns. Um, however, I will do so inside the speculation section and will follow each up with my own thoughts about how it may play out, if I even have a guess at that point. Um, then any speculations I have that are not connected to a known mystery will go at the end. Um, this will also be true for any speculation that addresses several known mysteries, just for clarity's sake. Um, we will thus keep track of the mysteries as we add them, and my unconnected or comprehensive speculations as well, updating them as the story answers them or alters what we project. Speculation is basically the forward-looking counterpart to the theme section, in that both of them are observations about patterns. Theme looks backwards, and speculation looks forwards. Because of this, the two often have some overlap or interplay. Correctly identifying a story's dominant themes is often the best tool for accurate speculation. So then, here are the things I think we should expect to get answered. Um, what does the world look like outside this facility? The trio actually tries to begin parsing this in the library scene. As Ray says, the answers to these questions will change things for them after they escape. There are two questions related to this idea, um, and I'll go ahead and put them here. What are other adults in the world doing, and where do the infants come from? I don't have a lot to speculate on any of this right now, because it's not clear if the entire planet is under demon control, or just a single nation, or if they're in an entirely different part of the universe. Um, there are obviously other adults doing at least some tasks aside from being house moms, 
as the first thing Crone says to Isabella when alone was to thank her for the opportunity to return to this side. The infants all must come from somewhere too, which raises the possibility of breeding farms or artificially created humans somewhere else in the world. While there are a ton of details still to wonder about demon society, it's clear that a central figure is the one referred to as him, so the next mystery is, who is him? I stated already that the offering of prayers and need to present a special meal for him suggests something of a ritual or tribute, so perhaps he is a religious figure, perhaps a supreme authority of some other kind. His good graces are worth all this trouble and worry, at the very least. Next, what is the significance of the red flowers? I mused on this already, and I don't really have a good guess. It's not clear if the red flowers that the boss figure is holding are the ones we saw growing out of Connie, which might imply that they only grow out of a host. Are they also food? Medicine? Something with religious significance? There's not enough to guess yet, but I can't help but feel like those flowers might be the actual things that killed Connie. The credits include imagery of them changing from white and unfurled petals into the blood-red flowers we see, which seems sinister enough, certainly. What is the song that Isabella hums? Um, I confess I haven't spent the time to isolate this yet, so I can recognize it in the future, but its timing in the first episode makes me wonder if it is connected to her own past, perhaps to when she herself left one of these farms or first learned about demons. Let's see. Uh, how do the tracking devices work? Ray has taken over investigating this matter after proposing radio waves as the most likely tech. However, they raise the idea that they may sound an alarm when destroyed, that there must have been some reason Isabella would make sure they knew of the device's existence. They wondered if some kind of unknown demon technology might be responsible as well, which kind of expands the possibilities. However, they seemed confident that the devices couldn't pinpoint the individual or sound a warning if they got too close to the wall or gate, which sounds like a fairly unsophisticated system. I do agree that Isabella must not believe they can be defeated easily to have shown her hand so deliberately. Finally, a very pressing mystery, who is the traitor? I think the episode tries to suggest that it will be Gilda, but that actually strikes me as something suggested too strongly. Perhaps they will worry that it is her and that changes how they go about things, but if she is the traitor, then I think it's being telegraphed too strongly. The thing about there being a traitor at all raises an interesting question, namely, why would one of the children aid Isabella against our trio in the first place? Two things occur to me. One is that Isabella has come clean with them, or they figured out something about the truth of the world, and spying on Emma and the rest will allow them to save themselves from becoming food. In this case, it would have to be one of the older children. The other possibility is that she didn't give any clue as to what the spying was about. In fact, it could even have been presented to one of the younger children as a kind of game that she wants them to secretly tell her about where they go and what they talk about. A younger child makes more sense in that scenario as they are less likely to grasp the truth of things or be suspicious about Isabella's request. I would like to point out that immediately after Norman suggests there is a traitor, it cuts straight to this little kid ringing the dinner bell. If I'm not mistaken, this is the same kid who it showed running and stopping outside a doorway back at the beginning of this last episode, immediately before Crone and Isabella have their private discussion. There's no obvious reason they even showed that little three second clip, which makes me wonder if that kid is stopping outside the door where this discussion is taking place. It's probably too bold of a speculation to guess that he listened in to Crone and Isabella speaking, and thus ended up volunteering himself to spy on other kids too, um, perhaps without even knowing what was going on. I don't know, but it's odd to have shown that bit if it doesn't mean anything. So as to speculations that are not attached to any mystery, um, this might actually have crossover with the traitor question, but might also be a separate thing. But I get the sense that something is up with Ray. There are several times where his reaction to events made me wonder if he already knew some of the truth of the outside world. 
I already went over how much less put out he seemed when Emma and Norman told him about Connie. This could just be his character, but he was similarly unperturbed when Crone showed up and again later when she cornered him and Norman. Again, this could be his personality, but there are other discrepancies. In that very first scene of the series, when the trio were at the gate and wondering about its purpose, there is a moment where he is actually shown on the other side of the bars, though it's clear in scene that he does not actually cross over. When Emma quotes Isabella about how the gate is dangerous, he is quick to say that that is obviously a lie. He will say something similar during the second game of Tag later that episode about the little fence. While the three of them are thus talking, a lot of the other children come up on them, and this leads to a discussion about what they will do when they leave the orphanage. Each of them suggests some innocuous wish, like seeing a train or going on a date, but when they ask Ray, his response is that he'd have to survive first. Isn't that curious? Further, when Emma says she doesn't want to leave because she's happy right now, he will lower his head and say, happy, huh? These reactions don't seem all that unusual if he had some idea of what was going on outside. Don't forget how quickly he leapt to the conclusion that it was a demon society outside the walls. Now, I don't know what all that means, whether he is secretly on the demon's side, or he figured out that something is amiss about the world and has been piecing it together, or what. But when I talked about the goals and characterizations of our trio, I talked about how he might be looking out for number one that he is not motivated for the sake of others in the same way as Emma and Norman. He may very well have wanted to escape with them because it increased his chance of success, but trying to take everyone like Emma wants and Norman supports might actually decrease his chances compared to going it alone. He is quick to make decisions, but equally quick to abandon them, so he might be reevaluating his own best move from moment to moment. Anyway, I don't speculate some specific course of action from Ray right now, but I get the impression he knows more than he lets on, and that he is the most likely of the trio to act independently or surprisingly. Lastly, I speculate that part of our trio's plan to escape with everyone will be figuring out how to tell them. It's something they've brought up already, even wondering if they might need to lie to them. Toward that end, I suspect they will bring some of the older kids into their confidence first. Remember, Emma struggled to accept the truth of Connie and the demons despite seeing it with her own eyes. She had trusted Isabella explicitly up until that point and didn't want to believe otherwise. How much more will other kids resist without getting to witness it firsthand? Thus, the more people they can bring into the secret first, the more united the front and more convincing the story when they do share. And of course, having more help from capable hands will help them race the clock. Don and Gilda seem like the obvious next step to me. It would be especially hard to tell Don since we know that he and Connie were close to one another. Likewise, the show is trying to suggest Gilda as the possible traitor, and so if any of the trio also pick up that vibe, they might resist telling her. That whole trust and betrayal theme might be really prominent in the short term for our story. In fact, that's part of why I think Gilda is unlikely to actually be the traitor. The fear or mistrust of her is enough to give their suspicions some narrative consequence, and it resonates perfectly with this theme, especially if she is innocent. All right, that is it. Um, I don't have enough sense of the whole world to speculate too broadly, and it may be that the story stays a closed loop for most of its run. Next video will be the fourth episode analysis, and we'll have the long look that includes the scene-by-scene -scene walkthrough, and so I will see you next week.